so good. I want to give you one verse before we take our seats. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. We don't always stand for God's word, but we believe it's important and reverent to stand for to stand for the reading of his word because it is life and life giving. Verse 8. By faith, everybody say faith. Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went even Everybody say even. Though he did not know where he was going. Anybody ever feel a little lost in your walk with Jesus? Come on, somebody. Do you always know where you're going, but do you believe he's taking you somewhere? Do you know what it looks like every time? How could we, right? Abraham, it was accounted unto him as righteousness, the Bible says. That's why God chose him, because he was willing to go, and he didn't even know where he was going. That's the that's important thing to, to note here. That's why he's the, he's the father of Israel. He's the father of the faith. Y'all may take your seats this morning. Look to your neighbor and tell him my title, Planning for Uncertainty. Planning for Uncertainty. Well, that sounds like a contradiction there. How do you plan for uncertainty? Before I get into that, though, I want to give you a couple announcements. How many are familiar with the Forever Young O Group? Two people. Come on, somebody. Just lie to me. (laughs) We have an O Group for our seniors called the Forever Young Club. And we want you to join in and have community. You can go to 1cchurch.org slash O Groups, or you can talk to Pam G. Gwaltney. That's my mom. <laughs> After service. And she can sign you up, but they got their first, uh, they, they, they like get together for coffee and food and hang out and talk to each other. It's just, for, it's just to get to know each other and have a little social time, you know? Nobody wants to be alone, so don't be. Sign up. That's why it's there. It's for you. Look to your neighbor and say, it's for you. It's for you. Is it for me? No, it's for you. It's for you. Sign up. It's going to be good. The first event is... I think at Pam's house, end of June. Once church.org slash O groups, click the find my group, select Forever Young Club, click join. It'll notify Pam. She'll say, welcome. It'll be good. Or you can just talk to her in person and do that. We also have, is it a week? It's a week from Saturday already. Our outdoor movie night. Come on, somebody. It's like a 40, no. 30 foot, it gets bigger every time I tell this story. It's like a 30 foot screen outside. We're going to be watching Luca, Lucia, is it Luca? It's L-U-C-A, it's a Disney movie, it's really good. And just because you've grown don't mean you can't be watching no Disney. Maybe you need some instead of that other stuff. You know? Sign up for it. There's going to be free popcorn. This is a public event. People go, can, can others come? That is a silly question. Any event we have, we want others to come. Okay? So for the future of this church, anytime there's an event, you don't have to ask, can I bring somebody? Yes, you may, and we want you to. You know? That's good. But we, are, we got a billboard going for the movie. We got social media. We got all kinds of stuff. So we want the public to see it and come, and we'll see what happens. But it's going to be fun. Whoever does show up on the back parking lot, the 30-foot screen, free popcorn, and it's going to be dark and fun. So bring your blankies and your whatever you sit on, unless you like pavement. You don't want to sit on the pavement. But we've done that with a nice thick blanket. It's not so bad. It's good. I think we'll have water too. We'll go all out. We'll give them some water. (laughs) How many know what today is besides Sunday? How many know what comes 50 days past the resurrection? Pentecostal Sunday. How many know what Pentecost Sunday is? Good. Somebody knows. Penty, 50. This is the first, the first, I didn't say last, first outpouring of God's spirit on man. That's called the birth of the church. 
You see, the church, the church doesn't exist until union forms with God that they could go do something. And he said, go wait for a sign that you may be endued with power, that then you don't need a manuscript, you don't need preacher notes, because you can go preach the gospel because I will be in you, he says. I didn't write it. Isn't that good? That's good because I don't like studying anyway. So I'd rather God just be in me and come out of me and speak through me because I was never a good student like that. But Pentecost Sunday is the 50th day after the resurrection when they're waiting in Jerusalem and in the upper room, the Holy Ghost fell on those who waited and they spoke with tongues. I know it's crazy, but if God can heal someone in Africa and God can heal someone in the United States at the same time and you believe that, why is tongues so scary? It's in the Bible. Can I get an amen, somebody? Well, that's weird. So is Lazarus raising from the dead. That's weird. So is people that have a diagnosis that says they're going to die and then the doctors can't find it no more because God healed them. That's weird too. So I don't know about you, but I like to be weird for Jesus. I don't want to be a follower of the world. I want to be a leader for Christ. And so today is Pentecost Sunday, and we give thanks. And how many know that he still pours it out? How many know he's still pouring? This is not a gift for some. The Bible says this is the gift for all. This was to non-believers. this happened to. This is not Romans. This is not to the saved church. This is to non-believers. Anybody that calls upon the name of the Lord who repent and is baptized in the name of Christ shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a gift. Would your, would your earthly father give you a stone if you ask for bread? How much more will your heavenly father give you those who, who ask for the Holy Spirit? It falls on you. It fell on them. And it wants to fall on somebody today. It wants to fall on somebody in their closet. It's weird, I know. It was weird too when it fell on me at 25 in my bedroom on my knees because I was trying to figure out my life. It was really weird, but I knew the scripture and said, oh my God, Joel 2.28, this is that. That's prophecy, people. That's when Joel spoke of Acts 2. You don't even know that. Go read your Bible. But I knew that, and I had a little bit from my dad, and I said, all my life, 25 years old, I don't understand what this is, but this is that, and I, I recognized by his word. It was so good, and it changed my life forever, and God wants to change your life forever the same. It's free. It's free. All you got to do is take it. It's free. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to buy it. It's not a work. It's a gift. So good. Is Colton in here? I know what I need. I need a good Vans tennis shoe. Hey, we got like a thing going on here. No, Lonnie, Ben, uh, Jake. Jake, you're so grown. The last year, I don't recognize you no more. You're like a man now. That's Jake. We got the 1C shirts going on. Pretty cool, huh? Y'all like it? Maybe you should turn in your connection card and you might get one. <laughs> It's a joke. I hope you all have one. If you want a shirt, just see Taz after service. But Taz, seriously, bro, can you like speed it up? People these days don't have enough time to wait for you. It's an impatient world. We, just, just throw it. Just throw it. Give it up for Taz and his shoe. Just throw it. Just throw it. Just throw it. Thank you. So <laughs> you didn't know you were going to be inspired by God's word today with this. Ooh, it smells so not good. So, so uh, Taz, this morning, we're leaving for church. And um, Sorry. He says, hey, Dad, did you know vans, no matter how you throw them, always land right side up? And I said, no way. Now, I did not validate that this is the only shoe that does that, but I took it for face value that no matter how I chuck this thing, it will land right side up. Does anybody want to test this theory for me? Okay, Emily, come on up. So we're going to do it three times. I'm going to give it your best spin. Keep it, keep it in this vicinity. We don't hit nobody in the face, okay? Just, just give it your best spin, twirl, whatever you can do to make it land upside down. But let's face the audience so they can see too. There you go. Just throw it like right there. No, just, just throw it over there. You stand here. You, you going to make it? Okay. I know, it's, I, know it's, I know I'm putting a lot of pressure on you right now. You stand there and just, just throw it that way. Right side up. Okay, this time give it a good spin. Really try to make it land upside down. Oh, right side up. I really, like, this is the one. You're going to break this rule. You got, it's certain. Go. Right side up. It's guaranteed. Thank you, Emily. You can take a seat. Right side up. Let's do one more. That's, that's four. Let's do five. Let's just, let's just be certain. I, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, throw it. That spotlight got me right in the face when he threw it. It's like an eclipse. Okay. 
Right side up. Okay, give it up for Taz and his shoe. Take that thing away, goodness. I didn't know nine-year-old's feet could smell like that. Now, that's what you call being certain. How many wish life was like that? How many wish everything you did was that certain that you knew no matter what, it was always going to land right side up, there was never going to be an obstacle, it was never going to be challenging, it was never going to land, land the other way, but how many know that often it actually lands upside down, and you're like, now what? Well, how do I turn this shoe back over? Or often it lands upside down and it actually turned out to be a good thing later that you're glad maybe it didn't land right side up. It's this... It's this thing about uncertainty. It's, the title is a play on words. It's you can't plan for the unknown because you don't know what it is. But you can be prepared for it. You can get some insurance for it. Why do we buy insurance, right, to, to cover the unknown? I, I can't say that we're planned for the unknown as how it should come, but we're covered in case the unknown does something we, we can't expect. We cover it financially. That's about the best we can do in this world is insurance, we get medical insurance. Not only do we pay for life insurance, we get medical insurance. We buy insurance for anything to protect us from the unknown happening because it's in the future. But life is not as guaranteed as that shoe, and it's definitely not as certain as that shoe. How do we plan for that which we do not know? We can't. We can never plan for the unknown, but we can plan for how to handle the unknown as it happens. Everybody say preparation. Preparation is the plan, the path that leads us to understanding the obstacle of uncertainty. In this, we may find ourselves being able to trust in God more than ever, overcoming worry and fear, knowing God's in control. See, we don't have to always know, but if we're prepared, we can recognize what to do with that uncertainty when it arises and give it to God. Perhaps today you may find peace in your unknowns as maybe God wants to lift them from you today. Maybe God wants to take those unknowns from you so you don't have to worry over and over. Is any any worriers in here? We got a few. And what I know I know what worrying is. When I was a kid, my mom said I was a worry, you know what they call you? A WW? A worry wart. My mom said I was a worry wart. That's a, nice, that's a nice visual. I never thought about that later in life, how that looks. Um, a worry, wor- I would worry myself into staying home from school with belly aches and worrying about this and worrying about that. And I would be consumed by worrying. And now I see my son doing it, Caleb. He's a, Colton is not a worrier. <laughs> Caleb is a worrier, and he's gotten better, but he's taken my worry gene, and he's taken it up a notch. And so now as a grown man, I'm trying to spare him some of his grief so he's not gray by 12 and trying to tell him that worrying does nothing good. Nothing. I'm not talking about being prepared. That's a good thing. But worrying about how and if at some point you have to relinquish control because you never had it to begin with. So as long as you think you're controlling it, you're going to worry. As long as you think you're in control, you will worry. All you people online, as long as you think you're in control of your finances, you're going to worry. God gave you that job, so bless him back. As long as you think it's your ability to keep you from being sick, it's your ability. I'm not saying we can't help that. We should eat healthy. We should take care of our temple, all those things. But at the end of the day, it's God who's provisioning us to stay strong. So when we know that, we can get rid of the worry. So how do I plan for uncertainty? Where do I go? I am a very controlling person, not with people, with my own objectives. Let me say that again. Is anybody else controlling with their their aspirations? They, They believe it. And they think it should be. And I'm not talking about dominant controlling with people and and narcissistic, nothing like that. I'm talking about when you set your mind to it, no one's going to stop you. Well, sometimes it doesn't work out the way you want it. You ever seen the fighters? They say, I'm the best in the world. I'm the best in the world. And they go out, boop, they're out cold, Rusty. 
first fight in the UFC. Because they have to have the mindset to get into the pack of wolves, to get into the fire, to go after it. But sometimes it just doesn't work out with the shoe up, you know? And so when we live that kind of mindset, that's a good thing. And you will be successful in your life. But there's some times where if you're not able to handle when it doesn't go your way, that that one little thing can crumble all the triumphs you had. So if you don't know how to handle losing, they call it sore losing. My son, Caleb, I love you. I hope you're not watching, but he is really bad at losing. He's, I was never a competitive kid. He's a really competitive kid. I don't know where he gets it from. I guess it's from Michelle's side. My whole family was never really competitive that I knew about, but if he loses, I said, I said, how you handle defeat is much more valuable than how you handle winning. I said, everybody likes winning, but how you recover from defeat is where it takes real discipline. I said, and guess what? Your shoe's not going to always land right set up in life, son, so you better get used to this or you're not going to make it very long. I said, don't, don't sweat it. Count it as a blessing. Maybe you'll learn something. Maybe you'll learn something. Maybe we can learn something from things not going our way every time. But when we have that <clears throat> dominant, controlling mindset that we're going to do this, I'm going to do this, and then it doesn't go that way, we kind of feel like, okay, where do I go next? And some of us choose to run in that situation because that's where the pressure comes. The pressure is not really there when the sun's out. The pressure is there when the storm hits. How do you handle when they don't show up? How do you handle when they said they love you, but they left you? How do you handle when you said you would do it for Jesus, but then the baby showed up and you never were married or you never did this or that and it didn't go away. So now you're fleeing to another state so you don't have to pay for that kid. Oh, I'm getting real now. Do you just get up and leave? Or do you stick, you stick with it? Because that's where the pressure's at in that uncertainty because there's fear in that. So people get scared in that. And that's when they want to run is the uncertainty. Sometimes, I don't know about you, it's easier to know the outcome even if it's bad than to not know anything. Has anybody ever had that? Where sometimes you think something's maybe wrong and the doctor hasn't told you yet and the fear of the unknown is almost more overwhelming to your stress levels than just knowing, okay, it is this or it is that so I can have a plan forward. Has anybody ever felt that? I don't know which is more powerful. I've had moments with both. Um, I like to say no news is good news but that can be also me avoiding going to the doctor. <laughs> you can have no news if you never acknowledge there's an issue and you can just stay away from things that are uncertain because you're really fearful to face those things. But it says Abraham went when he was called. Now I'm sure Abraham was wondering, where am I going? And I'm sure when Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac, I know it's gross, he was wondering, is this really God's will? But God called him to test him, and he didn't sacrifice Isaac because God was just testing his willingness. It's about your willingness. Are you willing is the question. And if you're not willing, God can't use you. I love y'all, but if you're not willing, God cannot use you. God could not do many miracles in, in, in Nazareth because, he, because they didn't even have the faith of a mustard seed. They had no faith. He can't do many miracles here because he was just the carpenter's son. But you can be sitting on a diamond ready to explode with blessings from heaven, but God will wait for you to step forward towards it, even when it's uncertain. So in this controlling nature, we say, where do we go? You get uh, in this mental avalanche, I call it. It's like, you better have your spreadsheets going because you got so much coming in, you're losing control of what's coming in. You don't know where it's going. You don't know what's going out. It's because you've, you've built up to this cloud and now you don't know what to do. So do I run or do I stay? How do I allow God to intervene in my uncertainty if I abandon his intervening assistance, excuse me, by fleeing the situation? Y'all know any God hoppers? You know any job hoppers? Do you know any relationship hoppers? Do you know any lease car hoppers? Y'all got that dealer that lives on the street. They always got the new car. Doesn't that just bug you? Because they like get them for free, you know? And they... If we never stick with something, we'll never finish it. And the, the devil wants you to get really deep in your Bible so God can scare you enough with uncertainty so you'll run away and never come back. 
He wants you to go out of town that weekend. That's the weekend God gave you a word you should have heard. He wants you to take off the summer because that's what, that's what everybody does. But maybe that's the best word coming to your season. Like don't abandon God's word. And uncertainty, don't avoid it. Are we calling it quits in our obstacles too soon? Do I require God to define it before I pursue it? Oh, this is really good. Let this sink in. Do I, like, let's pretend this is you saying it to yourself. Do I require God to define it before I pursue it? Anybody? Maybe not now, maybe at some point. That was me. That was me. What does that mean? That means I'm not doing anything until God clearly tells me what it is. Well, that'll never happen. And I thought it would. And I'm just waiting on a word from the Lord. And I've, I've told this story, and I'm going to keep telling it and because people need to hear it again. There was a point after years and years of avoiding planting a church and being a pastor to the church that I wanted to exist that I couldn't find, I finally had a talk with my dad in the kitchen, and he said something else funny, but I don't know if I should share that with you, but he said, you want to be a pastor, you're either crazy or called. <laughs> I said, thanks, dad. That really makes me feel good. Let's hope it's called. But you know what? He was telling the truth. But what he said was, that's not what we're, I'm mentioning here. He said, I said, how do you know when God calls? I don't know, dad. I hear all these people talk about how God just spoke to them. And I got the Holy Spirit in me, Dad, and I still don't hear God like that. Now, I feel the presence of God. I can, I can feel the anointing of God, and I can, I can worship God, and I can do all these things, but I cannot hear him articulate to me something in detail. Is there something wrong with me? He says, that's not how it works. He says, you just start doing something. You just start down a path. And so when he said that, I got all this relief because I was in this season of uncertainty and so scared to step forward because it was not clearly defined up front. And so when I knew that all I had to do was like start doing something, God would, God would show me more. And that something ended up being one seed, the social media a sermonette inspiring platform on only the internet so we didn't have to talk to people because I was scared. Here I am, a singer all my life. Could sing in front of anybody, Jim, but I was scared to talk God's word to people because it was different. It was uncertain. I was scared of what would they think? I don't want to look like that. Dear God, I'm not qualified. And so when he said, just start doing something, I, th I thought I can do that. That's a little easier. And maybe that's not why I'm not hearing from God like I thought. And so I started just doing something. We started posting one post a day to Facebook. Just saying something good about God. Maybe reference in a verse, a little one-liner inspiration quote. By the way, we've done that ever since. And now we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, and I'm not exaggerating, content all over the internet from five years of trying to spread God's word. Isn't that cool? Come on, somebody. Y'all awake out there? This is not about me. I'm saying that one little nugget to try led to five years of hundreds of saturation. You go to One Seat Church on Google, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. That's from repeated planting seed. Keep it going. And so, and so we did that. And so after we started doing that, we started seeing, hey, I think we need people in this. <laughs> I think we need to see a face for this to resonate. This is no longer satisfying. So then we said, we need a Bible study. I know, it's, it, I'm gonna scare my wife if I say the church word, so we'll do a Bible study in the school. Well, no one let us have a place to do a Bible study without paying a lot of money. Well, eventually we got to hold a Bible study and like some people showed up and we actually taught them like uh, some Bible studies and it was pretty cray cray. I'm like, wow, look at that. Just six months earlier, we thought nothing could be done. So by that fall, we realized that we needed to have a church service because there was nothing to open up people's hearts, like with worship. There was nothing. Nobody's going to just walk in cold to these Bible studies. Well, a few people, but they might scare you. But they need God too. 
You need a door for people to walk through. So that's when we said, okay, now it's time to make it a church. And it was a year later from the first social post, we held our first service at the high school. And I'm sharing all this with you because all that came from the fear of uncertainty until we had that conversation that you just do something and God will steer it. And that's what he did. He started steering it. And now it's been five years since January 2017. Yes, that's actually when the church was started, even though we didn't hold a service till January 2018. And now we're in 2022 in our building. And then we're about to do construction because yes, we got our loan. We got it. We're waiting on the dotted line in three weeks. But we're, now we're going to build out our building. And here it is five years later. And it started with that conversation. And actually, there was other signs that God gave. See, after I learned that God doesn't speak that way, I started realizing he was speaking to me all along. This is not even in the sermon. I could preach all day on this because it's in my heart. I got it down here. He, he, there was years of this. And I didn't know there was years, there was panic attacks. There was things like, I was so critical of them in that church and how they do it. And God's saying, because you're waiting for someone to do it for you. This is your vision, your thing. Go after it. If it's not going to work, it's okay. But go after it. Don't wait. And so I said, okay, I'm almost 40. I'm not waiting no longer. And that was like, I was 37. Yeah. No, I was 38. I don't know. My math is so bad. I'm 43. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that window of uncertainty that pushed us into a new dimension with our faith. When I was just a guitar player at church, I was really comfortable being a Christian. I mean, a guitar player. I mean, I had a heart for Jesus, but I was more worried about playing guitar. But the guitar never should replace my, my, my heart for God. In the, in the instrument, this happens a lot actually with musicians in bands. In, in serving in general, they get so used to serving, they quit coming to church when they're not serving. That's dangerous. I'm speaking real today, y'all. Can you tell? You've got to keep God's word in, in reverent worship first for Him on Sundays. You got to keep it for him first. Everything else is a a give back expression, but it's not the priority. That is first. And that's every day. Someone got offended a few weeks ago on social media because it says, 1C Church, come find your purpose. And they said, why do we got to come there to find your purpose? Why is it only in the building? I said, it's not in the building. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a figurative. It means we're going to open a door so you can hear God's word so God can change your life. How silly is that? Why do we got to come there? You know what they were? They just didn't want to come, you know? So they were, they, were, they were afraid of that. And so, so we're just trying to open the door, you know? And so they, 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 they were like afraid of that. And so they pushed back, like on our signs. No, the signs, they push them over. They don't push them back. They push them over because they don't like that. It's so cool. I love it. One social post, now we got 94 signs that go out on Sunday morning. I guarantee you no crazy church in Missouri is doing that. Come on, somebody. Do you want to do it? Do you want to do it? Do you want this thing to win? Do you want to see God change lives? You got to get excited for the energy that's going into it. God died on the cross for you. What are we going to do for him in these windows of uncertainty? How do I plan for it? Well, what have we seen? What do we watch? Watch this. Let's go to 1 Timothy real quick. Chapter 6, verse 17. It says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. He said it's uncertain. But to put their hope in God, which richly provides with everything for our enjoyment. What have we seen? We've seen the world. What have we learned? We've learned the world's ways. What are the world's ways? They're distractions to understanding God when he's trying to speak. There's a balance. We talk about having balance. We've got so many different uh, natural remedies today, but nobody sells Jesus on Amazon. You know how many things I bought on Amazon to find balance? Oh, I just need this supplement. Oh, I need this. Oh, I need this. I need that. And then I return the thing because it doesn't work. We're looking for balance in this world, but we're not looking to the right place. 
for balance. You can clap for that. He says that is uncertain. When you put your trust in wealth, that is uncertain. But to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. How can we be secure in uncertainty uncertainty when we invest in these distractions? It's like quicksand. The love of money is not, uh, money is not evil. It's the love of money, the Bible says, the root of evil. And what that means is it can make you feel fearless. Then, when that's taken away, guess what happens? You're fearful. Because, Timothy just said, that is an uncertain way to live. So when you get faced with a situation that you don't know how to handle because the money's run dry, what will you do? You will crack. But, he says, if you put your hope in God, come on, somebody, who richly provides, he will keep you stable in the uncertain seasons that everybody says that don't look good. But God knows you're going to be good. You're going to be good. And guess what? If you never see good, you never hear good, you never read good, you won't know what to do with good when it shows up because it's uncertain to you. You'll think that's the devil. God's trying to bless you now with something good, and you think it's unfamiliar, so it's uncertain, so you're scared of that too. That's something good. It's because you don't know anything about the good because you're distracted with all the bad. Think on these things. What have we seen? What are we looking at with our life? Oh, I can't stand negativity because I've, I've grown up being a negative person. And probably around age 30, I started picking up on it. And I started hearing how I sounded to people. And I started saying, I don't want my kids to learn that because I'm teaching them to live in that. Live in fear. Live in the worst case. Live in don't do anything because this might happen. At some point, you have to take a calculated risk for Jesus Christ. Calculated risk means it might not work, but it might work. Does anybody know what that is? Come on, somebody. I'm not, they say be crazy with your face. What faith? Well, well, crazy faith is still has discernment. I had a pastor tell me uh, when we were, this is funny, when we were looking at buildings, and this is a pastor who had just bought a building, actually right down the road, and renovated, and we were talking about like buildings and stuff. And he said, be faithful. He's like, but, but don't be crazy faithful. Like, don't be crazy. Like, don't be crazy now. Like, he was saying, like, and I got what he was saying, but I'm like, well, I'm, I'm just crazy. I can't undo that. Like, I, 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 like, hit the gas and worry about the brakes later. Like, no, I'm just kidding, y'all. I'm 43 now. Okay, I know the brakes are there, but if I don't hit the gas, I'll never be able to test the brakes. You know, and so he was like, be crazy, be crazy, but don't be crazy, crazy. And I was saying like, like we're crazy with discernment. It's calculated risk for Jesus. That's the difference. Like we're not fools for Christ. We're, we're crazy, faithful Christians who, who know the gospel and we discern if this is a good move for us, even though we don't know how it looks. Abraham had crazy faith, but he was wise enough to discern, okay, God, God is probably okay to follow. If God told me to do it, I can probably bank on that. And so I want to encourage you with that, that when you start seeing and looking at God's word, you know what we tell people who said they want to give their lives to Christ? The first thing I do is I send them some scripture. I say, if you don't understand what's going on here, this won't make sense to you. I want this to root in you. So I start kind of, I start kind of coaching them down a path. And I want to see like that they want to, want to know. Because if the heart doesn't want to know, the heart will not retain. And if you have ears on your head and you don't open them to listen, you will not retain. The Bible says that's been since the beginning. And so we do that because we want to, we want to see them grow. But it's easy just to live in distractions. Oh, man, I'm like the most ADD person at home. I'll just avoid it. I'll just avoid... Con- I, confrontation. I would just avoid it for so many years of my life with people who irritated me. I just avoid it. But God will will never deliver no problems or he didn't promise the absence of problems, but he promised direction through the storm. He promised how to navigate the storm. It's really hard. It's really hard. Actually, I had another talk. Me and my dad, we talk all the time on the driveway. Can I just, can I just say that? We have these talks, and I, there's other things. I had, I had said the other day, it's mostly me just venting, and he listens. 
because he's my dad too. And I said, uh, it's really hard when someone comes up to me and asks me for advice on something I have no idea what they're going through. I said, I'm cheating them if I try to give them advice on something I have no experience in. Now, I know, I know I got the title, but I'm a human being. And so I'm doing them wrong if I try to just always pat them on the back when they're going through something that's bigger than my experience. And I'm wise enough to know that. And so I said, I try to help them with things I can relate to, like marriage. I got that one figured out. You know, kids, I got that one figured out. Uh, you know, ups and downs, managing a household, I got that one figured out. I'm learning. It never stops. But like something above me that I've never touched, I don't think it's fair to try to lead them down something I'm not able to give. And so I try to, I try to encourage them, say, let us help find someone who can help you in that. Because we want you to find the help you need. That's direction through the storm. Jesus directs us through the storm with our church, family, our Bibles, the Holy Spirit, the lead and guide us, Christian music, worship. It's all one big communication vessel for the Lord. So when you wonder why he, you can't hear him, that's how you're going to hear him. It's through those things. That's how you hear God and you feel God. You know what's so cool? This is just flowing today. I love it. Like, I like when it's flowing. Maybe I should get like this more often, Jen. <laughs> we never had a joke before church. That's an inside joke. Like, 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 um, oh, I missed my thing here. Come on, come on. You got it, you got it, you got it. I don't know. It'll come back to me. God positions our rope to run short on purpose. You ever climbed a rope in gym? He'll position our rope to run short on purpose because if you can't reach it, he'll reach out when you call on him. If you can't reach it, he'll reach out. But if your rope always reached it, who guess who you're not calling on? Jesus. He'll reach out. My eyes have to look on the rock. That's Christ that brings peace amidst the chaos. He's my rope. He is the rope. His rope changes lengths when we need it to. That's so cool. How do I plan for uncertainty? All right. This is how we handle it. This is how we plan for the unplannable. It's not complicated. The first two words in Hebrews 11, verse 8 said, by Faith. By faith. Faith is belief in action. The demons believe, but those who followed Christ believed and took action to follow him. When you say, I want to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of my sins and publicly profess my obedience to the word of God, and then I follow Christ, you're saying, I follow the teachings of Jesus. That is faithfulness. Because you're doing something with this belief. Doing nothing is not faith. Doing nothing is not faith. People don't like to hear that today. They don't like to be told there's more for them. They don't like correction. But doing nothing is not faith. That's belief. And even the demons believed and said, we know who you are in legion. Thou art the Christ. What have you to do with us? Jesus, son of, son of God. Oh, just cast us out of here because we know you're the Messiah. So we cast him in a swine. We know the story doesn't end good for them. That's belief. Faith takes the belief into the uncertain path that God called you to. And even if you don't know what the road looks like, God is calling you to a path. Faith establishes the ability to handle the uncertainty. Faith establishes the ability. Faith is what causes you to be prepared when certainty hits. I want to give you two more passages here as we close up this third, third point here I want to give you today, that faith establishes ability. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 2. This is one of my favorites. Does anybody know the first two of Hebrews? This is a popular one. 
This is a popular one. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and that sin so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance. Everybody say perseverance. The race marked out before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Jesus is doing one of these. You ever seen that person and they do one of these? Jesus is doing this. Fix your eyes on him. The pioneer and perfecter, KJV, finisher of our faith. He is the perfecter, perfecter, the finisher, the pioneer, the originator, the creator, and the ending faith creator person. He is God. Amen. Amen. Look to your neighbor. Just find somebody. Creep them out. Come on. Come on. Look to somebody. Just give them one of these. Come on. Come on. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. Come on. Oh, you're going to remember this. PJ doing this 18 times. I'm going to remember this. That I am to fix my eyes on the TV. No, on Jesus. That's what faith does in uncertain seasons. I don't like some of the things I'm seeing in my life that I can't control right now. And I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about like my life, my life. But I got to understand, I can't control that. But I have to learn how to deal with it. I have to learn how to face it. Because I used to be the one who always Avoid it, and you can avoid it forever, but eventually, eventually, you have to face it. And this will cause you to trust like you've never trusted before. Once you've tasted in God's faithfulness, you will no longer fear the unknown. If y'all can stand this morning, I want this to really sink in. I'm sweating on my notes here. We welcome the unknown because I don't have to fear what it is. And when I'm faithful, God carries the weight of the unknown. That means he will navigate my storm when it comes. I wish St. Louis was always 70 degrees, no humidity and no storms. But when the storm comes, he's taught me, you know, when to go in the basement. He's taught me, you know, when we tell the kids when to go in the, say, like the, the, the tornado's coming, like we know how to handle the storm. It's no different. God didn't say there'll never be a tornado in your spiritual journey. He said, I'm going to tell you how to be safe from it, how to, how, to, how to deal with it, and you'll get through it. You'll get through it to the other side. You'll get through it. Faith establishes spiritual insurance that never expires and the premium never goes up. In fact, it's free. You don't have to pay for this because Jesus paid for your insurance on the cross. Do you know what a ransom is? It's an insurance. He paid the price for something to cover you. That's why it said he's a ransom to make atonement for our sin. That's why they sacrificed the lamb because he was the lamb and he was fulfilling the prophecy of the Old Testament that to be sanctified, to be made atonement for our sin, we had to, we had to sacrifice a lamb for sin. And so God said, I'm going to be the lamb. I'm going to go and I'm going to become your insurance policy for eternity. Isn't that good? Come on, somebody. And I'm going to end you with this story. That, that's grammatically incorrect. I said, I'm going to end you. I'm going to end with this story. <laughs> Too much ibuprofen. At different moments in my life, this, this doesn't happen as much, but I know it will happen again. When I really hit that place of fear or worry, and I know the Bible and I've prayed and I just can't get it out of my head. Has anybody ever had that where it's still in your head and it's like a broken repetitive record and you, you, you say, I've done everything I can do. Try me on this, it works, okay? Every time that thought pops in your head, you know how you take it captive and I know you're supposed to claim it, rebuke it and call it dead in Jesus' name. You know what you do? You picture the face of Jesus on top of it. Every time. I know it sounds crazy, but 
you do this a couple hundred times in that week and it goes away. Every time it pops up, you just picture Jesus. Every time it pops up, you just picture Jesus. And you, you, you get so tired of it popping up, right? You're like, God, help me. I don't want it. I said get rid of it, but it's still playing in my head. What do I do? He says, fix your eyes on the finisher. So I said, okay, what is that? I don't know what he looks like. I'm going to put him on the, 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 the version I think he looks like, you know, with the nice flowy hair and whatever. I don't know what he looks like, but that's Jesus to me. And that's what I see. And so like over and over, if you saw my brain in these moments, it looks crazy because it's like, boom, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hey, how you doing? Jesus, Jesus. Mid conversation with somebody else. Those thoughts are still playing. You ever had that happen where it's still playing and you're talking to somebody else about something else and they don't know you're having this crazy moment inside. You just keep saying, Jesus, Jesus, you keep seeing him. And eventually that thing is gone. Isn't that so good? I know it sounds crazy, but I'm telling you, when you're fearful, whatever it is, you want peace, he says, fix your eyes on me. That's all we have to see at this point. That's all we can see. He has risen. We can't see the fleshly man that dwell here on earth back then, but we've got a face in our spirit that we can keep seeing when we need it. And God never said he would run away. He said he'd be there for us so we can keep fixing our eyes on him and there peace will come. Peace will come, amen? Let's pray and we'll get into worship. Let's pray and we'll get into worship. God, we thank you now that you are the author and finisher of our faith, the pioneer and the perfecter, God. We don't have to wonder how, because of course we know who. If you called us, it's good. And I don't know what it looks like, but I'm okay with that because you said go, so I'm willing. And I know if I'm willing, you're gonna change my life. I don't have to worry about everybody telling me I'm crazy because you're gonna change my life because you called and you've got a purpose over this world. You've got a purpose over this church and you've got a purpose over this house my family, my children, my grandparents, my mom and dad, everybody, my neighbors. You've got a purpose because I am living out your will for my life and I'm going to plant seed in them. God, we thank you now. We go into this week giving praise with our eyes fixed on you. And if the house of God could say, in Jesus' name, amen. 